St. James's Street, London, January 18th, 1790. It is the eve of the Queen's birthday. At a quarter past 11, exhausted after an evening in the ballroom gallery at St. James's Palace, Sisters Anne and Sarah Porter decide to walk unescorted back to their home at Perros Bagno, a five-minute stroll from the palace. A man who had been lurking nearby stared hard at Sarah, cried out, Oh, is that you? Then struck her violently on the back of the head. The man retreated momentarily, then lunged forward and struck Anne on the hip. Four months later, by the end of May, more than 30 women had come forward with similar claims. The attacks continued. Woman after woman was, um, was uh, assaulted in the streets, either being pursued by the monster who cursed and blasted her and then ended up stabbing her in the buttocks. He also had a stratagem of fastening some very sharp object to his knee and then uh, thrusting his knee into the backside of his victim. And uh, other women were invited by the monster to smell a nosegay full of uh, possibly artificial flowers. And when they uh, had a sniff at it, he stabbed them in the nose with a sharp object he had hidden inside the nosegay. Whereas an attack has been made by a monster upon a young woman. Doctor and author Jan Bondison stumbled upon the story of the London monster while researching another book, The Fiji Mermaid. The thing is, uh, I was rather surprised uh, when uh, I started researching the story of the London monster that nobody had uh, written the case up before. It's a, it's a story so strange that uh, if it had been a novel, nobody would have uh, believed it. He has since amassed an impressive collection of contemporary monster prints, satirical cartoons, and newspaper articles. Nice original satirical print. So one of the wounded ladies shows her injuries to the magistrates, and here's Sir Sampson Wright having a close look. When the Porter sister's father reported the attack to the police, he learned that two other women had been attacked in a similar manner earlier that same evening. But the early London police force was an amateur affair, little more than the neighborhood watch, and ill-prepared to track down a serial slasher. 20 suspects were eventually dragged into the Bow Street office, but none was identified by the victims. But a white knight was waiting in the wings. John Julius Angerstein, wealthy art patron and the father of Lloyd's insurance house. John Julius Angerstein was intrigued by the monster's uh, long catalogue of crimes against the fair sex, and he personally went round to uh, interview each and every one of the wounded ladies, and he left descriptions of them in a book he wrote that was intended to be the handbook for the prospective monster hunter. A certain Miss Toussaint, whose clothes had been cut by the monster on uh, January 18, was described as young, about or rather below the middle size, good, agreeable countenance, lively, pleasant, and very pretty. Sarah Porter was not quite Angerstein's type. She was only mild, genteel, and rather handsome. But her sister Anne met with his full approval. She was young, below the middle size, with fine black eyes, good skin, fine teeth, lively, sensible, delicate, and very pretty. And Angerstein asked all the wounded ladies to give descriptions of the monster who had assaulted them. Some were describing a very tall man, others said that the monster was quite diminutive, and details of his clothing were also wholly divergent. Mr. Angerstein put up a reward for the capture of the monster, 100 pounds reward, and he announced that reward with large posters pasted up all over London. And 100 pounds was a lot of money in those days, so um, Angerstein single-handedly created a mass hysteria, and women were absolutely fearful of uh, being uh, attacked. 
Angerstein included a composite suspect description on his poster. He appears to be about 30 years of age, of middle size, a little pockmarked, of a pale complexion, large nose, light brown hair tied in a queue, cut short and frizzed low at the sides, is sometimes dressed in black and sometimes in a shabby blue coat. The monster attacks continued, increasingly cruel and unhinged. Damn you, bitch, I would enjoy a particular pleasure in murdering you and in shedding your blood. A journalist for the Oracle newspaper described the mood in the city. It is really distressing to walk our streets towards evening. Every woman we meet regards us with distrust, shrinks sidling from our touch and expects a poignard to pierce what gallantry and manhood must consider sacred. The newspapers sold their theories to a public increasingly hungry for the salacious details of the latest monster attack. He was a phantom, a demon in human form, a mad nobleman or an ingenious master of disguise. The reality was to be much different. As the monster mania spread, the London women were in a state of alarm. However, other London ladies are recorded to have ordered cork rumps or brass petticoats to wear underneath their uh, outer clothes copper bottoms to be safe from the monster's uh, rapier. It would take until uh, June 13, uh, 1790 for any important breakthrough to be made in the hunt for the London monster. The breakthrough came courtesy of the sharp eye of Anne Porter, whose traumatic encounter with the monster six months previously had left the fiend's visage permanently etched in her mind. While strolling with her paramour, John Coleman, fishmonger to the Prince of Wales, she spotted the monster amid the noonday crowd. She met with this monster one day in the park as she walked with Mr. Coleman, who noticed the spark. She told him how much from this wretch she'd endured, so he followed the monster and had him secured. The man introduced himself as Brennick Williams. He denied being the monster, but agreed to appear before the Mrs. Porter in order to put the matter to rest. And without any further ado, they went into the parlor where the Mrs. Porter was sitting, and both of the girls fainted dead away, screaming, Horace, it is him, the monster! And uh, William said, The conduct of the ladies, sir, is extremely odd. I hope they do not take me for that person who is advertised. The accused was an impoverished 22-year-old artificial flower maker and former dance instructor from Wales. A journalist for the Times described him as a young man of genteel appearance who unfortunately for his family has been in very dissipated habits of life which have led him into expenses among women. His friends are persons of character and reputation who most sincerely feel for the excesses and wanton behavior of this thoughtless young man. He was not the beast that the public had anticipated. Yet at the Bow Street offices of the city police, more than 20 wounded ladies identified him as such. If it be anyone in this company, this is the man. There is the wretch that wounded me. If I were upon my dying bed, I would take the sacrament. This is the man. Furious mobs pursued the police van as it whisked its frightened prisoner off to Clerkenwell Prison. English law of 1790 was wholly unprepared to prosecute the outrageous crimes for which Rennick Williams stood accused. Simple assault, a misdemeanor, seemed a hopelessly inadequate charge for offences that were, in the words of one journalist, in opposition to the dictates of nature and humanity. Common assault, even with intention to maim and kill, 
was a misdemeanor, and Winnick Williams, of course, hoped the monstrous crimes would be classified as such. And he was prosecuted for the felony of cutting the clothes of seven wounded ladies. With few exceptions, newspapers and printmakers had already declared Williams guilty. Arthur Pigott, the chief prosecutor at the trial, would later say that there was not one person resident in this great metropolis who was ignorant or unacquainted with those attacks which had been made upon the fairest of the most beautiful of nature's works. To side with the monster was to side with depravity, and even a meager association was to be strongly refuted. Williams's local member of parliament went so far as to take out a notice in the Times. The party denies that the man taken as the monster voted for Lord John Townsend in the late Westminster election. Standing in the dock, the frightened little man in the shabby blue coat pled not guilty and then addressed the court. I most seriously appeal to the great author of truth that I have the strongest affection for the happiness and comfort of the superior part of this creation, the fair sex, to whom I have, in every circumstance that occurred in my life, endeavoured to render assistance and protection. But the wounded ladies, the Porter sisters among them, argued otherwise. Each described her own uniquely horrible encounter with the monster in the dock. During his first trial at the Old Bailey, Rennick Williams was very badly defended. The solicitor who had been employed by his brother backed out in the last minute. According to rumors at the time, he was bribed by Mr. Angerstein. And uh, all the brother could do was to get hold of a young and in inexperienced barrister who had himself believed that Williams was guilty. And how Williams's heart must have sunk when one of his lawyers apologized to Anne Porter for representing the accused. Rinnick Williams was found guilty, and uh, it was in the power of Judge Buller to uh, sentence him to death or to transportation, but he did neither because he wasn't sure about this ancient statute under which he was prosecuted for a felony. So he wanted the 12 judges to be consulted before sentence was passed. While Rennick Williams awaited the decision of the judges, a strange pamphlet appeared on the streets of London. The monster at large, or the innocence of Rennick Williams vindicated, claimed in a singularly bombastic style and without any evidence, that Anne and Sarah Porter were in fact prostitutes who had conspired with the fishmonger Coleman to frame Williams and claim Angerstein's reward money for themselves. The astonishing accusations came from the pen of Theophilus Swift, an Oxford-educated hellraiser who earned his living as a poet and writer of provocative pamphlets. He announced himself as Rennick Williams' champion just in time to defend him at his second trial and the 12 judges did not agree with cutting of clothes really being a felony. So at the 13th of December, 1790, Winnick Williams was taken from Newgate uh, to stand trial for the second time as the London monster. Swift immediately went on the offensive, attacking the character of his victims. His abrasive style, a, a discordant mix of classical quotes, crude innuendo and offensive puns, was making him no friends in the court. His treatment of Anne Porter in particular made the spectators seethe. When Anne Porter was to give evidence, she clearly identified Williams as the man who had come up to her in the street more than once to insult her. And uh, Theophilus Swift tried his best to, to make her repeat these words that had been used uh, towards her. And rather unwillingly, she said, Blast your eyes, you damned bitch. I will murder you and drown you in your blood. Anne swooned, was revived with smelling salts, then lapsed into a shocked silence. Swift was not impressed with these theatrics. Your agitation, madame, he shouted, always seems to occur at the most convenient time. Theophilus Swift did his very best to uh, bully and harry the female witnesses. He also pointed out 
whereas the monster had been described as uh, having light brown hair, Rinnick's hair was uh, black. However, Mr. Justice Mannering wrote in his notebook that Williams had obviously made use of a dye to color his hair. When the women remained steadfast in their insistence that Williams was the monster, Swift advanced the collusion theory that he had formulated in the pages of his pamphlet. Referring to Coleman variously as a frog-blooded coward, a despicable buffoon, and Miss Porter's puppy, Swift raised the issue of the Angerstein reward. Had you directly or indirectly any interest through the medium of Mr. Coleman? He asked Anne Porter. What connection have I with Mr. Coleman? Good God, sir, no, she replied, calling his suggestion the most malicious falsehood a malicious mind ever dared to advance. Boos resounded from the courtroom walls. An incensed young man had to be physically restrained from attacking Swift. However, the Mrs. Porter, Miss Bourne and Elizabeth Davies all identified Rinnick Williams as the monster and he was found guilty and he was sentenced to two years in prison for each of the, these three assaults. That is six years in total. The monster attacks ended with the incarceration of Rinnick Williams, Newgate prisoner number 31. So, too, did the press's fascination with his odious crimes. The story of the London monster had been written, read and largely forgotten. At vermin-infested Newgate, where the privileged were permitted access to drinking societies and prostitutes, Williams continued to make artificial flowers, which he sold to curious visitors. Upon meeting Williams, many pointed at him and cried, Is this the man called the monster? Williams endured the humiliation by writing, and in 1792 he self-published a lengthy lamentation called An Appeal to the Public by Rinnick Williams Containing Observations and Reflections on Facts Relative to His Very Extraordinary and Melancholy Case. The tract, which failed to make a cohesive argument for his innocence, sold poorly and was largely ignored. Three years later, he submitted a groveling request for a retrial, in which he accused Judge Mannering of being needlessly biased against him. I am, sir, with all due obedience, and he has crossed out respect, and all the respect that is due, the most injured man living, Ah, Williams. So he didn't mince words. But the pathetic appeal was rejected by Mannering, who noted in his decision the fact that Williams had dyed his hair at trial in an obvious attempt to confound the witnesses. This he took to be a sure sign of guilt. Theophilus Swift, for all his faults, did divine the true nature of the relationship between John Coleman and Anne Porter. They were married at St. George's Church, Hanover Square, in the early spring of 1791. A journalist for the local paper appreciated the chivalric aspect. Mr. Coleman is rewarded for having brought the monster to punishment by the lady whose cause he so gallantly espoused. Coleman collected the Angerstein reward and the two lived happily ever after. Well, over the years, the debate has continued uh whether Rennick Williams really was the London monster. The original descriptions of the monsters very divergent, so it seems likely that there was at least one copycat criminal. It also remains a fact that there were no more monster attacks after Williams had been taken into custody and the entire monster mania was dispelled as suddenly as it had begun. Rinnick Williams was released from Newgate on December 16, 1796, having served his full sentence. He lost no time before marrying, and he had a little monster of his own, George Renwick Williams, son of the monster. <laughs> <laughs>